first time ever doing something like this, so please be patient. Care to actually join and ask questions like over voice chat? Uh, there should be a link Discord in my Twitter. If you get there, you can click that and join. Kind of ping me in chat here. So I know to give you the right role to get into the correct chat channel there. Don't worry, it is a very dead server, so... Um, I'm a huge nerd, as you obviously know. Uh, one of my big hobbies, besides the weird dinosaur stuff, is actually collecting antique Japanese arms and armor. Much as I would like to, like, drop cool samurai sword facts in, like, Discord servers or stream, whatever, uh, that would be a little boring, because there's a lot of stuff in there that would be... Like, you have to have a fundamental knowledge or understanding of it to understand what I was even talking about. So if I tried to just kind of put random fun facts, it would just be gibberish for the most part. But I figured there's a lot of people that seem to ask questions whenever I post pictures on Discord servers or just kind of talk about it. A lot of people seem to be really curious. And also, frankly, I've been asked by my mentor, how do we get more young people involved in this? Because most part, most of the collectors are kind of grumpy old men in their 40s, 50s, 60s, or older. As these collectors are starting to pass away, there isn't really anyone left to take over the collection and take care of those things. That's a real shame, considering some of these things have been around for almost a thousand years, in some cases, actually over a thousand years. Kind of need to find a way to get more younger folk interested in this and, and kind of take up that torch and continue to take care of these things so future generations can enjoy. Kind of my my objective here. The first things I want to go over is kind of talk about what the different time periods are for Japanese sword. So kind of roughly speaking, the Japanese sword first appears around 987. They kind of call it the Koto period. And they've actually got special terminology for the different periods for the swords. So this kanji character there is actually the kanji character for katana. You kind of see that that's how the periods are named. This is different from like the uh, historical periods that you talk about. The in here, Heian period, the Kamakura, Nabukucho, Muromachi, Edo, and Meiji. These are all kind of historical periods when you're talking about historical events or historical figures, but the kind of sword periods are different and they'll actually encompass multiple different time periods and sometimes the time period kind of cuts over. But the Koto period starts at about 987 and goes up to about 1600, and that is actually an important historical date there, and we'll cover that in a little bit. But the historical time periods that the Koto period covers kind of begins the Heian era, which is kind of the rise of the samurai. It goes through the Kamakura, where the shogunate was first established, the shogunate being kind of a military government. Shogun, rather than emperor, effectively ruling Japan. Nambokucho period, where that kind of central shogunate started to crumble and lose power and authority, and a bunch of civil wars start to break out. And then the Muromachi period, where literally the whole country basically just fragmented into, I think at one point, over 200 independent states all waging war and trying to conquer each other. And it gets into the Shinto period, where that civil war ends, and one powerful samurai warlord successfully conquers the whole country and unites it. Rather, it's a succession of three guys. One of them kind of... There's a saying... Oda Nobunaga ground the flour, Toyotomi Hideyoshi baked the cake, and Tokugawa Ieyasu ate it. Kind of a, a little saying that they have in Japan about how that big civil war period came to the end. And then kind of beginning 1600, maybe a little bit after actually, maybe 1605 I think, or 1602 technically speaking, is the beginning of the Edo period, or as they call that Shinto. The Edo period is kind of the end of that civil war, and where the whole country is at peace. And at least up for like the first, you know, from about, I think, 1605, 1610, and thereafter, they've actually blocked all of their ports to the outside. So Japan is a very cut off insular country, but it is also a very peaceful place. So swords kind of take on a, a different meaning because, well, there just aren't any wars going on. But they become more kind of pieces of art or status symbols. They're still definitely used. They're still definitely weapons. But they're not quite as practical, shall we say, as the earlier ones. And then we get into the Shin Shinto period where there's kind of somebody has the bright idea, well, these swords are actually kind of fragile and, and 
breaking compared to the older ones, we should go back to the old style. So there's kind of a revival of the style of swords and construction that was kind of done back in these time periods. And that's kind of the Shin Shinto period. And that goes from kind of the middle of the Edo period, 1780s, up till the Meiji period, ends kind of like the early 1900s, late 1800s. And then we kind of get into the modern era. This is kind of a visual representation of the kind of different time periods in Japanese history versus the sword-specific time periods. Dokoto is probably... There weren't really... The samurai didn't exist in this time period. The Japanese army, or, or soldiers, warriors, if you will, for the most part, what they represented or looked like were kind of similar to Korean or Chinese soldiers in the sense that they had big lamellar armor. They actually had big shields, kind of like a Roman shield, if you imagine that, and kind of spears. And they also had a short, maybe not a short sword, but like a, a straight rather than curved sword called a chokuto. But they very closely resembled the Chinese and Korean warriors of the same time period. It wasn't really until about the Heian era, which is where the Koto period begins, that we start to see the rise of the samurai where they kind of take on their own appearance and we'll kind of cover why the samurai were a bit different and and how they're very different from how they're viewed in pop culture in that time period but this is also kind of around the early aeon era is where the true samurai sword the first samurai sword actually appeared and we kind of actually get all the way up to the gendai period which is about 1868 through present um and you'll see that's actually reiwa's 2019 through present so this they're actually still making them today they only ever actually stopped making swords the traditional way for I can't remember how long it was but it was a brief period less than a decade right after World War II and that was because the Allied occupation forces said Japan you're not allowed to make any weapons of any kind and that included swords but there's actually a movement to reclassify swords as art objects and cultural objects which allowed them to kind of get exempted from that restriction about making weapons and that also it wasn't just Japanese people who were pushing for that. It was also uh, Americans and foreigners, and even, I believe, MacArthur was actually involved with that, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to go back and double check that. Quick aside, probably the Muromachi period through the Momoyama period, interesting time period in Japanese history because that's when that huge civil war breaks out where there's something like 200 different warring factions all vying for control of the country. Um, you would think that would actually be really good for sword protection, but it's actually the exact opposite. Kamakura period was kind of considered the golden age by many for sword production. This is kind of like before, during, and after the Mongol invasions. And then this period of the massive civil war, well, they weren't focused on quality so much as just getting as many swords out there as they could. So you actually see a general decline in quality in this time period, and then it picks back up here. But unfortunately, in this long time period here where there's that big civil war and they're just trying to get as much stuff out as they can. Yeah, during this time period, they were more focused on trying to get as many swords out there to arm these armies. And they actually lost a lot of the techniques and kind of artisanship that came out in this kind of time period here. And they actually start rediscovering and actually creating new methods around this time period in the Edo period. Now, that isn't to say that the swords in this area are bad, just you'll find much better ones kind of around here or even here or up through here or even present. Interesting, it seems that modern day there's some smiths that are actually rediscovering some of the old techniques from these their time periods, making things that look a lot like them. So that's actually really cool to see. Not that I could afford them, I think they're about 20,000, 40,000, 50, 60, 80,000 dollars for some of these brand new ones, but they're a sight to behold when you see them. So this is an example of Chokuto. These were those straight edge swords that were from the, the early period, kind of predating the samurai, very heavily influenced by those Korean and Chinese swords. Um, it is actually theorized that actually uh, sword forging technology and techniques were actually brought over from Korea. In theory, it's possible that the first, like, samurai swordsmith was actually Korean or Korean descent. We'll want to be careful sharing that info in certain circles because people can get very upset if you uh, kind of point to Korea being the origin of certain things. So a lot of people think katana is the quintessential or the original Japanese sword or samurai sword. It's actually the tachi. And I know you're looking at this picture and thinking, dude, that's a katana or that's basically the same thing, what's the big deal? There are some interesting differences between the two. One of the things, first things you'll know about the Tachi that is actually worn with the cutting edge down and it's actually suspended around the waist rather than kind of thrust through the belt there. I'm not sure, but I believe this cord here is actually used to tie around the waist. So this is kind of like a decorative way to tie it into a knot so it's nice and tidy. 
and not just kind of like flopping around everywhere. But this is actually, I believe, used to tie around the waist. Um, another thing is when they sign, the swordsmith signs the blade, they'll put their signature on the part of the tang, which is the part of the blade that actually goes into the handle there, that faces outward. So for a tachi, that would be this side that's facing us here. Uh, on a katana, it's going to be on the other side because the sword will actually be upside down with the cutting edge facing up. Another important thing to know about Tachi is they're kind of the first ones that are differentially hardened. What that means is, if you look at a Japanese sword, in fact, I might pull up an image here. It's actually a close-up of a polearm called a Naginata. But when you look at a Japanese sword here, you see this kind of white, misty edge, and then you see this kind of darker area. What that means is that there's actually two different types of steel structure here. This one is very hard, frankly, very brittle but that allows them to retain a very, very, very sharp edge, and it's a very durable edge. Again, the caveat there is that it's brittle, so if you have the whole sword like this, it could potentially break. But they figured a way to retain that really sharp edge that, that stays very sharp for a very long time, but also something that doesn't break is to kind of have a mix between the two. Though, so, I have any pictures of the yaki ide process. But in the forging process, what they do is they take clay, they take different types of clay, and they put like a thicker layer on the area that's going to be the blunt edge, and a thinner and a different kind of mixture, a different type of clay on the edge. And when they heat the sword, or they quench it, will actually cause this area to be cooler than the cutting edge. And so when they cool it, they kind of put it straight into water, and the crystalline structure will slam closed and catch the uh, carbon molecules inside that steel structure. So the faster it does that, the more carbon it'll catch. This is so hot, it'll and it quenches, and it's got that thinner layer of clay on it, this will actually quench a lot harder and a lot quicker than this area. So this contains a lot more carbon, and that's what allows it to be so hard versus this. Kind of the tachi is like the first time you really start to see that, and it's also the first time you start to see the curve. Um, another thing is people like to think that it's the quenching, purely the quenching, that causes that curvature of the sword. And it's true that it does cause some curving. Uh, sometimes, though, it causes the blade actually to curve the other way, rather than like this. Sometimes it'll cause the blade to curve like that. So, actually, the curvature is, is uh, intentionally shaped and hammered into it different process that happens after the quenching. They actually have like a hot iron block that they put on the back of the blade. They've got it kind of with the cutting edge up and they kind of use that to help shape it. Kind of discuss that when we get into the differences in the sword shapes. The reason why the sword started to curve is because of the change that happened in the warriors in Japan. Though, so as I was talking earlier, the earlier warriors were more like Korean or Chinese soldiers where they had that kind of thick, heavy lamellar armor and they had those big shields, almost like Roman shields. Uh, the samurai started actually becoming mounted archers. And you see that their equipment changed to match that role. It's kind of hard to see in this picture, but this armor is called Oyoroi, and it actually wraps around. So you kind of like this side, like the right side or the left side of the body is kind of like a solid thing. And then it kind of wraps around your body and you kind of fasten it on the right side. Because if you're an archer, you know, almost certainly you're going to be right-handed. So you'll have the bow in your left hand and you'll be holding the arrow and the bowstring in your right hand. So you'll be facing with your left side pointed towards the enemy. So it makes more sense to have that kind of solid side facing outward on the left. Uh, the front of the armor, instead of having like the loose scales like that, kind of like they would have had with the earlier Korean or Chinese style armor, they instead put like a leather cover on top of it, kind of fancily decorated there. That would allow the bowstring, just in case it gets caught, it'll just glide across that rather than getting stuck in any of the scales. Also got this thing here that also helps with that. Um, I can't remember exactly how that helps. Uh, but that is one one thing that they added as well. Also notice, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but you see this foot soldier here, his sleeves are kind of big and baggy and poofy. You see the samurai here, his right arm is baggy, but his left arm is actually kind of kept tight. And that's again, is to kind of stop the bowstring from getting caught on his sleeve as it, it kind of loose arrow or, you know, hits the end of that trajectory. Hopefully that makes sense. But you can see here in this photo, this guy dressed up in samurai armor, he has a tachi and it's worn kind of suspended from the belt, with something wrapped around his waist and it's worn with a cutting edge down rather than with a cutting edge up and stuck through his belt. Uh, most of these pictures, except for this one, came out of that book up there. 
called Samurai Armor by Trevor Absalon. You can get that on Amazon. I think it's like 40, 50 bucks. Part of a series. This one is literally just about central body here. He doesn't talk about the helmets or the, the foot guards or anything like that. It's literally just this. It's super detailed and it's a really good book. Highly recommended. Here's some other examples of early samurai. So this is a cool picture because it shows the type of foot soldiers that you would have. These would be considered boot rather than samurai. This guy here, well, he's got a, a you know, sword. This guy has something called a naginata. People call it a halberd sometimes. I think it's more appropriate to call it a glaive. Kind of like all the advantage of a sword and a spear put together. Samurai, as you can see, is this tiger tail here is actually the scabbard of his sword, but actually put fur on the scabbards of the sword to kind of help keep rain off and tiger stuff that was dyed to look like tiger was very popular. This guy is clearly a mounted archer. Another interesting note, this is a woman warrior also using a naginata. There were actually women warriors and there was actually a couple of famous women samurai, for example Tomoe Gozen. We'll talk about her a little bit later. This is kind of a cool thing out of that book by Trevor Absalon explaining samurai and how that side, that left side is what's going to be facing the enemy as they're shooting their bows because they would actually be riding into battle shooting arrows at each other as they went or they'd even have kind of archery duels. Even some books, for example, Heike Monogatari, which is a long book, they'd kind of charge into battle shooting arrows at each other and if you read those long epics, historic epics from early Japanese history, they always describe how the samurai kind of like riot at each other shooting arrows and then they pull out their swords and they fight with their swords and then they like tackle each other and like pull each other off the horses and then they're grappling on the ground and then one guy finally gets the upper hand and pulls out his dagger and stabs the other guy either in the throat or in the armpit to stab and pierce his lung and his heart and you know then it goes into cutting off the guy's head. A bit grisly, but that was how they would demonstrate to their, their superior or their lord that they had done their duty as a warrior. Hey look, I killed this guy. I actually did my duty as a warrior. Please reward me with land or money or gifts or something. That was kind of how things worked back then. That's also how they got a rough idea of how many enemies they killed. Also how they knew definitively whether or not important or famous people were killed in the battle. Yeah, it's very. there's a lot of similarity in the combat and warfare between the samurai and European knights. And actually, when you get into the Sengoku Jidai, which is about the 1600s, or not 1600s, probably about the 1500s, um, they're almost using the exact same military strategies where you've got big formations of foot soldiers with long yari, or pikes, basically, and guys with, you know, like, big formations of dudes with guns. And they also figured out the kind of revolving, you have the first rank fire and then they step back and then the second rank fires while the other guys reload. There's a fa very famous battle where an entire cavalry charge was cut down by gunfire. That was kind of the first time that that happened. The only thing that the Japanese didn't really get was cannons. And that was actually not so much because they didn't, they failed to realize how important or good cannons are, so much as the way that Japanese castles were built in that time period. And also the fact that the Japanese countryside is very mountainous and very hilly, and it's really difficult to transport big, heavy bronze cannons through that kind of terrain. The other thing is kind of the way the Japanese castles were built. If I talk about a Japanese castle, you're probably picturing that really tall white building, with the nice, elegant, tiled roofs and all that. Most Japanese fortresses in this time period were actually wooden. And for the most part, they used earthworks, which are actually pretty tough to blow up with cannon. Gravy curvature of the handle, uh, that is also kind of a stylistic thing. Uh, that also kind of helps that like wrong curve at the end, that helps it from not slipping out of your hand while you're swinging it. And that actually reminds me, thank you for bringing that up. Part of the reason why it's important that the samurai were mounted warriors and why that affected the shape of the sword, why it became curved, because a curved single-edged sword is actually really, really, really good for mounted combat. That's that's kind of the reason why in Europe they started going to sabers, because, I mean, technically speaking, a saber is a single-edged sword. So basically, the first katanas, or the first Japanese swords, the first tachi, were cavalry swords. They were cavalry sabers. So that's why they had that nice curvature, and why they were single-edged, because you didn't... The false edge strike, the one where you'd be using, like, this edge, if it was sharp, even on foot, is generally not a very strong strike. It's always much stronger to use something called the true edge, which is holding a European sword 
pointing the edge straight up, or pointing the point straight up, I should say, cutting edge that's facing away from you is called the true edge, and that's the one that you're going to be striking with as much as possible, because that's where you're, you know, that's a natural movement. Trying to go the other way, with your hand pushing the other direction, you're not going to get as much strength with it. Generally, it makes more sense for a cavalry saber, where you're just going to be riding past people, slashing at them quickly, slashing down on a foot soldier or something, yeah, it's all, it also makes sense to have it tied on the side, but that's more kind of it's easier to draw the sword. Like, they didn't need to do any kind of quick draw movement from horseback. But yeah, that's that's kind of why they you use a saber when you're on horseback, because it's a lot more effective to just kind of do those quick slashes using the true edge as you ride past. You're liable to, like, probably break your wrist if you try to use the, uh, the false edge, if you're, like, riding by and you try to smack somebody with a sword. Another interesting thing, that little round thing, that donut-shaped thing, is actually spare bowstrings. This is a Japanese bow. Notice the handle area is actually not in the middle, it's actually closer to the bottom of it, and that's what allows them to shoot from horseback. This is based, I mean, technically speaking, this could be considered a longbow because it's like longer than the than the archer is tall. I mean, I wouldn't consider it to be the same thing as like a European longbow, but we go by that definition of the bow being longer than the person using it. Technically, it's a longbow. I could be wrong there. Don't don't kill me if you're an archer or an archery expert. Kind of coming back to the samurai being the mounted archer again, kind of think of them almost like a an armored turret on a battleship where the horse is like the battleship but, you know, unarmored, but they've only got this limited range of movement. Japan, kind of in the old days, also was not quite how we see it today. A lot of these provinces, um, these are kind of called prefectures now, but they were almost like independent countries in a way. And in fact, during the Nambokucho period, I think it was, like the northern half of Japan actually split off and declared independence. Uh, this particular arrowhead. So they actually had a big variety of arrowhead shapes. This one, I think the artist just chose because it's really cool looking. Um, this one is a special purpose arrow. It's called a rope cutting arrow. Um, usually used in naval combat, I think. Uh, was the mounted archery mostly samurai versus samurai, or do they also target the foot infantry as well? Um, I believe they tried to focus on shooting other, other samurai because that was kind of like a prestige thing. It was like a duel, um, but they weren't dumb, they wouldn't be stupid and kind of go, oh, you're just a foot soldier, I'm not wasting arrows on you. If somebody was threatening them, or if they didn't see another samurai to shoot at, they'd be like, all right, cool, I'll just kill these guys. They were very practical and very intelligent. Now, that's that's kind of one of the things is I hear people say, oh, the samurai were not very smart, they banned guns because it was dishonorable, and if they had just kept the guns, they'd be super awesome. Well, there's actually a practical reason why guns were banned in Japan. Back in the uh, samurai period, the samurai loved guns loved guns. They actually had more guns in Japan and also higher quality than most countries in Europe by the end of the 16th century. Let that sink in. And I know a lot of people like to kind of talk about the English Sea Dogs versus uh, Samurai because there's this kind of, I think there's a case where some English pirates got into a fight with some Japanese out at sea and they kind of totally wrecked them. And there's another story about some Spanish conquistadors in the Philippines encountering Samurai who would have been uh, exiles during the Civil War period and they totally wrecked them. Uh, one thing to remember about that is that it wouldn't necessarily be all Samurai. They, you know, would not have been at their best. Guys were kind of like defeated exiles, probably didn't have the best equipment, and a lot of them probably weren't even samurai. A lot of them were probably local, like Filipino, um, or just kind of general peasants from Japan that had picked up weapons and escaped. Uh, but the Battle of Sekigahara had about 200,000 people, and I think the largest army in Europe at that time, standing army, was the Spanish army that had about 30,000 regulars, the Tercios. So, I don't think an invasion of Japan would have been terribly successful. That said, the samurai were not very good at naval combat. They, they got their shit wrecked when they invaded Korea in about the 1580s, 1590s. They totally ruffle stomped the Koreans on land, and even the Ming Chinese, China came in to help Korea. And the Japanese kind of wiped the floor with them both because they were so good with guns. But they failed terribly at the naval combat because they, their ships and their combat for that time period was more geared towards raking enemy ships with gunfire, with the, the, the muskets or arquebus really. And the Koreans and Chinese had cannons and closed decks so their crews were protected from all the gunfire and the arrows. So they just kind of stayed at a distance and just blew up the Japanese ships. There's also a theory that Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who ordered that invasion of Korea, did that not so much because he genuinely thought he was going to be successful invading Korea or even all of China, 
but more that he wanted to thin the number of samurai in his country because he wanted to kind of make sure there were not as many people bell and challenge his authority. Yeah, you would think, I mean, after Japanese modernization, kind of in like 1890s, 1900s, the Japanese figured that out. Like, yes, we're an island nation. We need to be really good at naval warfare. And they learned from the British and they actually bought British warships and started building their own. Kind of during the First World War and even the Second World War, Japan was actually very, very skilled at naval warfare. They were the Japanese, kind of the samurai in that period, were also very kind of conservative, and they were accustomed to fighting battles on their inland sea. Got a map of Japan here. A lot of their naval battles were happening either like right on the coast or in this shallow inland sea here. And they kind of used their traditional ships that had open decks, and it made sense to use that technique where you had all these guns just kind of raking the decks with gunfire, slaughtering the crew before boarding and trying to fight hand to hand. Kind of like the ancient Romans, like you'd think the ancient Romans living in the Mediterranean would have figured out naval warfare really well, but the way that they figured out naval warfare was they just turned it into floating land warfare by building huge flat ships that they'd use to, less, you know, sail up next to people and then board them, as opposed to the ancient Greeks who rammed the ever-living shit out of everything with their triremes. Um, they could be kind of similar to galleys. I don't have any pictures of them, but yeah, they'd, they'd be somewhat similar to galleys. They, you know, they mostly use oars to row, row around. I think sails as well on occasion. One of the things I wanted to show in this map, I don't know if you can quite see it on the stream, we've got red lines running through here. It's actually five major roads running through Japan during the early period, and that was actually very influential in kind of the development and formation of Japanese swords and how the different traditions spread. Kind of coming back to this map in the description of Ye Olde Japan, each of these provinces was almost an independent country, and again, during that civil war period, in many cases, they were literally independent countries trying to fight each other, conquer each other. Whenever you kind of look at Japanese writings from kind of, you know, pre-modern Japan, be the kanji character for country being used to refer to stuff like this. So that would be like Dewa Han, Satsuma Han. Where's Satsuma? It's going to be around here. Yeah, there it is. Satsuma Han. But it's the same ca kanji character as country or kuni. So a lot of people kind of dig on Japanese swords for, oh, so the samurai think they figured out the perfect sword shape and they stuck with it and there's no variation ever. Well, kinda sorta. There is variation. Um, it's very subtle, um, but, you know, they, they kind of stick with that same general. It's got one cutting edge, it's got a sharp point, and it's got a gentle curve, or sometimes a more extreme curve. But there is some variation in time period, starting from right to left. This is like the earliest, so this is an example of a chokuto. I think this is a more recent one. It's probably not from that early, early, early era, because those ones tend to be not in the best condition. A lot of the ones that we have today were found in burial chambers and not very well preserved as a result. Relative to other swords, this is kind of an example of a Heian era Tachi, and I'll show another example of that later. But I think Heian is considered to have a very beautiful, elegant, graceful curvature to it. And you can also see how things change history as things change within Japan. Like, this is the Nambukucho era, Tronker, compared to the things that came before it. Kind of delicate and refined. This one's a little bit more strong than say this one you know it's got a if you look here it's got a taper so it's kind of thicker here than it is up there part of that has to do with age and the way that they restore the swords and the fact that the area of the sword that's used most often is at part most part this area is not used all that much this area on a sword that has not been sharpened well has not been restored or polished is technically the term. This general area is actually dull. I've actually got a sword that I will show later that actually still has some of that dull area right there. That's, that area is called the Hamachi. You can see in this time period, this is when there's like two rival imperial courts and a lot of civil war. And so people started carrying fucking swords with big aggressive tips as a way of kind of showing off and posturing and kind of saying, don't mess with me. And then things kind of change a bit and you get into the civil war period. And then the swords kind of get shorter and easier to use. And this is where the katana actually starts to appear. They wear it with a cutting edge up, kind of thrust through the belt, because that's actually easier to draw quickly if you need to. Um, it's also more convenient as a foot soldier to have it there. You're going to be kind of like running around and jumping over stuff and, and fighting and kind of more secure if it's tightly stuck to your body by sticking it between your belt and your body, as opposed to kind of loosely dangling from a, a cord or dangling from the belt where it's kind of free to bounce and flop around. Not that that wouldn't happen on horseback, of course, but probably, probably worse if you're on foot, kind of jumping and dodging and fighting. Need to 
not have that thing swinging around as you're trying to like dodge and, and sidestep and all that. The Kamakura period, as I mentioned earlier, is considered by a lot of folks to be like the golden age of Japanese swords. So part of the reason why this is considered like the golden age is this was a relatively peaceful time. Like there was a big civil war that happened before this where the samurai actually overthrew the nobility and established themselves as the new new ruler. Past, and the shogun was kind of the, the military dictator leader of Japan, and the emperor was more of like a, a figurehead. And kind of, they, they moved the capital to Kamakura, which is why it's called the Kamakura period. There was a big demand for a lot of swords, for one, to kind of arm all these new samurai and all these kind of nobles. Of course, the samurai were now like the noble caste, so they had a lot more wealth and a lot more money to spend on these things. Another thing that contributed. Another thing is there was not a whole lot of warfare going on, so the blacksmiths, the swordsmiths, could focus more on developing their skill and making really high quality stuff rather than just turning out a ton of swords for war to arm the masses. Um, another interesting development that happened in this time period, Mongol invasions happened in 1274 and again in 1281, and that actually changed the shape of the sword. So you can actually see this is like an earlier Heian era sword, and these things were actually not super effective against the, the Mongols in their thick armor, but the Japanese realized they had to find their swords to make them more robust. And so you see a shape more like this. See, it's a bit more stout and there's less of a taper from the end to the tip. Again, this kind of has part of this narrowing towards the tip has to do with age and how they, they restore the sword, how the tip is the most commonly used part of the sword, either for thrusting or flashing, but it's, it's a much more robust kind of shape there. Uh, this is also, if you're familiar with the famous swordsmith Masamune, time period where he was active, as well as several other really famous swordsmiths like Go Shige. I think Echunori Shige is like a little bit after Masamune. He was actually, I think, one of Masamune's students, kind of more the Nambukuchu period, I think. But there's also like Awatokuchi Yoshimitsu and the Rai school. A lot of really good stuff came during this time period. The Romachi period kind of happens a little bit later than that, if I quickly jump all the way back here, we've got the Kamakura and then we've got the Nambukucho, where we see those huge chonky swords that are kind of really big and aggressive and fierce looking, and then the Muromachi, where I, the shogunate, that imperial, not the imperial, the kind of central government starts to lose its power. Basically, kind of during this period, when the shogun says, hey, stop invading your neighbor, they ignore him. He's just totally powerless, totally inept, can't do anything, and not able to maintain the peace, and that's when shit starts to hit the fan. This is where we see the birth of the katana, or the katana. The sword is now, it's got a lot less kind of stuff in the way. It doesn't have, this is called itomaki, that wrap there. It doesn't have these fancy hangers. It certainly doesn't have this kind of like leather hanger or this long cord that's used to wrap around the belt. We don't have quite as much of the metal fittings on the scabbard here. Um, this, these mounts do have a lot of that stuff because the owner, I guess, wanted to be a bit fancy. Uh, these mounts probably came from the Edo period, but there is some similarity to how this would have looked roughly during the Muromachi period. For example, they probably, they would have had like a leather cover on the scabbard. Either the, the scabbard itself would have had the leather like stuck onto it or to have like a removable leather cover. A lot of times this wrap would either be leather or it'd be either cotton or leather with lacquer on it. And then the, the uh, Tsuba, the handguard here, oftentimes had lacquer or was made of leather. All of this was to help it not basically deteriorate in the field because they're out in the, you know, they're actually fighting wars. And they're gonna be out on the field for long periods of time. I figured this was kind of like a good example katana or just katana. Again, one of the big distinctions here is it is now worn with the cutting edge up. So the signature is gonna be on this side. So it's the opposite side was on a tachi. I think during the Civil War period, a lot of the, the kind of higher ranked warriors are still going to wear their sword. Cutting edge down is still going to look like a, a tachi. As you get into the Edo period, it's kind of more comfortable to just have that sword thrust through the belt, especially since if you enter buildings, especially castles, you're kind of required to surrender the sword as you enter. Easier to just slide that out of your belt that it is to like untie the thing and then carefully tie up that cord. I've actually got a sword from the Edo period that shows this is actually like a very decorative way to tie up that cord. What you would actually do, this thing, this cord would be about as long as the whole scabbard here. Kind of put this, the scabbard through your belt. That cord would kind of go under the sword and then up through the belt and then again. So generally when you, when you're actually wearing it and actually using it, take this, this 
backward and just kind of lay it straight and just kind of wrap it in bear knot at the end here. I can actually show you that because I have an Edo period sword where I, I don't have the fancy knot. This actually is one of my favorite samurai. His name is uh, Honda Tadakatsu. Yes, that is the same name as the Honda cars. I don't know if they're actually related, but he was a very famous samurai from the Warring States period. He, as you can here, he still has his sword slung with a cutting edge down. Um, and this thing here is called a Yari. And this is actually one of Japan's national treasures. And this is actually a fairly accurate representation of it. It's called Tombogiri. Legend about how he was out in the battlefield one day and a dragonfly tried to land on the spear and got cut in half. Don't think it was quite that sharp. Uh, I think more realistically, he was probably standing there with a the spear kind of pointing up in the sky. And knowing how long that spear shaft was, that's probably about the same height that the, uh, the dragonflies would be flying and zipping around. And a dragonfly probably just flew into his spear and cut itself. Probably some truth to the story about how the Tombogiri got its name. I don't know if it's necessarily so sharp that a dragonfly cut itself just trying to land on it, but it is a very beautiful spear. Not quite sure what museum it's in, but you can, I believe, occasionally see it on display. And that is a huge spear. That that blade, like, you can see, compared to him, quite big. And I believe it's actually a little bit bigger than that in real life. Kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about how the Japanese samurai changed their, their style of warfare. During this time period, they're not so much mounted archers anymore. They're, there's a lot of them who are still cavalry, and a lot of them are still archers, but they're not kind of exclusively fighting on, on horseback shooting arrows at each other anymore. Also, a lot more, I guess, kind of foot soldiers wearing more heavy armor, more heavily armored, similar to the samurai, and using similar weapons. Another kind of big distinction is, of course, this is when firearms make an appearance, and they've actually got much heavier, thicker armor. They also created European armor into their own stuff occasionally. See that in some suits of armor, and they also kind of make their own, you know, they'll kind of look at a European chess piece and go, I could make that. And so they make their own version of it. Uh, you also see a lot of cool, like, bulletproof armor. See, in the Edo period, there's actually suits of armor that have, like, a little dent or a little protection in it. It's actually beneath the lacquer. And what happened there is the armorsmith made the armor, and then the customer who commissioned it came to inspect it, and that it was bulletproof, they'd actually shoot the armor in front of the guy. They wouldn't have anybody wearing it, of course, but they'd shoot the armor in front of the guy, them that this is bulletproof, this is safe on the battlefield. And then after the, the customer said, yes, I like this, I'll take it, that's when they kind of add that finishing like layer of lacquer and whatnot. Again, I could be wrong, there might be people out there that can correct me on that. There are suits of armor that actually have those like dents in it from, from that kind of a test. Now, the Edo period is after that Civil War period. Kind of going back to what I was saying earlier about how there's a saying in Japan about how Oda browned the flour, Hideyoshi, or Toyoshi, baked the cake, and Tokugawa Ieyasu ate it. There's kind of three really important samurai warlords who helped to unite Japan. The first one was Oda Nobunaga, and probably would have actually completed the job had he not been betrayed and murdered by one of his generals. There's a lot of controversy as to why he was betrayed. There's one theory that there's there's kind of a, a personal tiff between the two where one general, the general who betrayed him, trying to negotiate the surrender of an enemy who had his mother as a hostage. And he said, you know, I, I swear to you that, you know, such and such condition will be met if you surrender. The guy kind of agreed to it. And then Oda Nobunaga was like, no, nah, I don't agree to that. And he did the thing anyway, and the guy killed... Akechi Mitsuhide's mother, hostage. Uh, Akechi Mitsuhide is the person who betrayed Oda Nobunaga. That's one theory. Another theory, allegedly there is some like secret letter that he found that Oda Nobunaga was saying he was going to overthrow the emperor. He felt like the emperor was totally, you know, just a useless figurehead and we needed a government. Shogun type person should officially, de facto, and de jure be the ruler as opposed to simply de facto the ruler. That one is a very controversial theory. I don't know how much weight there is to it. Personally, I'm leaning more towards the Odo Nobunaga basically getting the other guy's mother killed, being the primary catalyst. He's like, all right, I'm, I'm done being loyal to you. You're a dick. Anyway. So that's what happened with Oda Nobunaga. He almost conquered all of Japan. His successor, yeah, Oda Nobunaga was a very interesting character. He was very pro um, kind of learning and adaptive. He actually did a lot of trade and was very interested in Europe and European things, fighting a lot of, I guess, Catholics, a lot of priests and 
missionaries into Japan, not necessarily because he himself wanted to be a uh, Catholic, probably because that was like a condition of the Portuguese or the Spanish, like importing stuff to Japan for him. Also apparently like really fond of style cakes and sweets. And I think he started incorporating a bit of European style clothing into his own being like European furniture and stuff. He built a castle that also had some kind of European architecture design incorporated. Not that it was like a European style castle, but not a strictly Japanese construction either. Very interesting character, very controversial. He was very much a dick in some cases. Fortunately, that was kind of the way that a lot of these samurai warlords were because that's what you needed to be to survive and not get conquered by your neighbor and have you and your whole family killed. Also have to kind of look at it in the context of the time. The way he actually started out, he was actually like the daimyo of a really small province and a really small clan. There was like a massive clan with a, a huge army that was marching through his territory. And of course they didn't ask permission because they had something like 10,000 soldiers, maybe more. He only had like 3,000 guys to his you know, loyalty to, under, under his command. And they're like, yeah, whatever, this guy is nothing. We'll crush him like a bug if he resists. Um, he actually figured out what route this massive enemy army was taking and it was through narrow mountain passage he went and hid in the in the forest and waited and a thunderstorm came up so he and his tiny army actually attacked the main encampment that included the leader of that massive enemy army that was going through his turf and uh, caught him and killed him and that sudden surprise attack and the knowledge that their their warlord their master was killed caused the rest of this massive army to rout so that was like a huge like amazing victory and it sent shockwaves through all of japan and everybody was kind of scared of him now because they figured he was really smart really bold and really daring because nobody in their right mind would have attempted something like that that's that's kind of how he gained his reputation and that was the kind of person he was to do all sorts of really bold daring things that nobody else would think and dare so in some ways he was actually a really cool character so anyway toyotomi hideyoshi came next uh he helped carrying on unification he crushed akechi mitsuhide kind of sealing his place as the professor of oda Kind of continue that that process of conquering the rest of japan he had a very interesting and diplomatic way of doing it where he basically go to war with somebody like a few provinces away and there'd be like people between him and his enemy and then he'd send a diplomat him and the enemy and he'd say hey look we control a huge chunk of japan we have a massive army we're marching through your territory you can either join us and keep like keep your territory and be rewarded for loyalty and servitude or you can join the enemy that we're about to crush and be crushed with them and lose everything for choice and the vast majority of the time people were very smart and said yeah okay i think i'll join you and uh, help you defeat our neighbor and so he quickly expanded from there um, unfortunately he died without an heir well he died he died with an heir but it was kind of dubious as to whether or not it was really his kid and also when he died, his child was very, very, very young, so that resulted in a lot of instability. And then eventually, uh, another general, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who also served with Oda, kind of broke away and was able to successfully defeat Guardian or Custodian heir, Battle of Sekigahara. I think the heir had actually matured by that point, but that kind of period where he was like a baby and then a child or a teenager, and there's like a Custodian rather than him as the ruler, really weakened his legitimacy and made it very easy for Ieyasu to kind of bide his time and build up his alliances and prepare to eventually overthrow him and become the shogun himself. And Ieyasu is the guy who finally, officially, formally ended this massive civil war period and founded the Tokugawa shogunate, which lasted about 200 something years and moved the capital of Japan from Kyoto, Edo, which is now modern day Tokyo. And that is why Tokyo is the capital of Japan today. So the Edo period is named after the city of Edo, capital. Um, no more big battles or very few directions or rebellions here and there. For the most part, it was a very, very peaceful, tranquil period. And there is kind of a massive samurai caste now. Because of these civil wars, a lot of people started out as peasants and kind of became warriors and earned their reputation and established themselves as samurai and kind of started a samurai lineage. But because there were no wars, they didn't really have much of a place. So that kind of created a big kind of socioeconomic problem that just got worse as time went on. But the other thing is because there was not a whole lot of war going on, um, the merchants were actually very successful because peace is good for business. So they actually became really, really wealthy and successful. And the samurai kind of got a little resentful of them because the samurai couldn't match that success. They weren't allowed to be merchants themselves or kind of take up a, a profession other than being a warrior or 
soldier or i guess kind of working in the admin of the clans so they kind of passing all these laws and rules that the merchant class were not allowed to wear long swords that was actually something that started before this during that civil war period um Hideyoshi, Hideyoshi, because he started that way. He was actually, I think, a peasant or son of a low, low-ranking samurai, and he worked his way all the way up to the top. I guess he did not want anyone else to be able to do that. He did the great sword hunt. They confiscated a bunch of swords from the low-caste people and, you know, basically not the warrior class, and melted them down and made it into a big statue of Buddha. He also passed all these laws basically saying, if you're not born samurai or born into a samurai family, tough you can't be samurai now also banned the wearing you know part of this great sword hunt is the anyone who wasn't samurai was not allowed to wear the long sword you could only have a short sword so that was one of the things uh, the other thing is uh, they weren't allowed to wear flashy colors they weren't allowed to wear like bro uh, gold aid which is like gold silk silk but it's like actual string or textiles made from gold Silver. They were forbidden from wearing that the a lot of the merchant cast they'll have jackets or coats or kind of over the top part of a kimono where the outside is very bland and boring it's kind of like black or brown maybe have like a little crest on it like that but the inside has cool colors and and bright artwork on the inside so it's kind of like a neat subtle way of, of showing off it's like you know when you're out in public you're wearing this kind of drab boring solid black or solid brown but then when you get inside into like a restaurant or a friend's home and you take that jacket off you can show off the cool inside and kind of flash off your wealth there also a neat thing in Osaka that is actually technically still around today because Osaka was a big port town and a big merchant city. A lot of really wealthy merchants there, but they weren't allowed to show off or kind of spend their wealth on anything like swords or big fancy houses or flashy clothing. So they spent it on food. So they'd kind of go around, you know, just kind of gorging themselves on all this really delicious food. But that's actually still a thing people do today in Osaka is they'll just kind of like walk around the town and just bounce from bar to bar and restaurant to restaurant, kind of bar hopping and eating all this really tasty, that's kind of an interesting aside there anyway back to the samurai stuff um, again no big battles everyone was kind of like walking on foot now um wheels were banned so no no wagons or wheels or or carriages or anything like that and you're probably thinking what the hell that's weird the reason they did that was that was actually the shogunate did that and that was to prevent from easily doing logistics and kind of easily bringing a bunch of provisions to castles and weapons and ammunition that other good stuff because if they could do that, it would make it easier for them to plan a rebellion and rebel against the central government. So wheels were banned, specifically as a means of controlling people so they couldn't rebel. Uh, that is also why guns were banned. They were not completely banned, they were just banned for everyone except for the Tokugawa clan and their like immediate top trusted supporting clans. For everybody else, firearms were forbidden or they had like a, I think there might have been a quota, like you're only allowed to have so many in this castle. A lot of interesting sneak stuff there. Yeah, you'd think it's such a, a weird thought process, but when you look at the way the roads were and the Japanese geography, it actually makes sense because if you if you ban wheels, ban it from everybody except like the official group, it actually makes it really, really hard for people to properly prepare their provisions and properly move things before it all spoils. And like it'll, again, you know, the wheels make it easy to move stuff around. So if you that it's harder to move stuff, so it takes more time, and it's easier to catch it. Yeah, yeah. Samurai, kind of up till that point, were very, I guess, especially the, the warlords, and maybe not necessarily the individual samurai, but the warlords in particular were very, very tricksy, and they were always kind of looking for ways to improve their own station. And if that meant, like, invading your neighbor, or switching alliances, and betraying your per previous guy, you know, they they do it in a heartbeat. So that was kind of done with the mentality of, this is how the, the clan leaders, the daimyo, would be thinking. And they, you know, there's, like, half of the country supported the Tokugawa shogunate in that civil war, in that final battle. The other half of the country did not. So this was one means to prevent that other half of the country from conspiring to eventually overthrow the Tokugawa. And it was... Weirdly enough, it was an effective way of doing it. One of many, many things that they did to keep the daimyo in check. The other thing is they, you know, the losers basically had their lands confiscated and redistributed to other people. So your ancestral land was basically taken from you and you were forced to up and move to somebody else's ancestral land, like on the other side of the country. And that helped break up their local regional alliances and their kind of ancient family ties to, you know, these are our neighbors, we've lived next to them forever and they'll help us overthrow the central government 
government. And interesting side note, a lot of the people that fought against the Tokugawa were actually Catholic. I shouldn't say a lot, but many. As southern Japan was where a lot of the Europeans were coming and bringing in all their goods and trade and all that. And part of the condition for trading was you have to let our missionaries come here. You have to let us build churches or even cathedrals. A lot of Catholicism and Christianity kind of seeping into Japan in that, that southern area, that southern island. It's also kind of like a, a religious element to that that rebellion, and that's also why Christianity was prohibited and punishable, punishable by death. This guy, I believe this is a photo from the late Edo period, it's not a guy in the like early 1900s or something just wearing clothing. I think he's an actual samurai, and this is kind of like fairly typical clothing that you would see the samurai actually wear. Maybe a little bit formal, a little bit nice, they may be didn't necessarily walk around like this outside all day, every day. This this kind of thing here is like a jacket, so maybe remove that. That would kind of be a more accurate representation, though. So people were not fighting in armor on the streets anymore. Another interesting thing you'll see in certain parts of the Edo period is the sword shape changes, and it actually stops being as curved, and it becomes a lot more straight. And part of that is because it was like a fashion choice. Part of that is because it's like better to have a straight sword when you're fighting on foot, because it's easier to stab and thrust when you're on foot, and a straight sword is better better than a curved sword for thrusting. My mentor kind of joked with me when I, I talked about that one time. He said, well, also because everybody, you know, such a peaceful time, everybody kind of forgot how to fight. But they just kind of relied on stabbing each other. These two images, I can't remember where I got them from, uh, but this is kind of like a brief picture glossary of all the different terminology for swords. This particular sword is in the kind of standard shape. They call it Shinogi Zukuri. That means this has got this central ridge here that'll exist on both sides. More importantly, it's got this little ridge here called the Yokote that kind of differentiates like the long cutting edge versus the tip. The tip is called the Kisaki. The thing is the Kisaki and specific this spot here is kind of pointing to Oshi is an important thing as well. That is see that differential hardening going up and down the length of the blade here, right? So that's called the Hamon, kind of bright edge here. And if you look really closely, I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually a really thin white line or lighter line right along that border there, called the habuchi. But anyway, the hamon goes all the way up the length of the sword and even into the tip. And when it goes into the tip, they call that the boshi. Part here is like the kaeri, which is where it turns back the uh, blunt edge. Those are important basal points is what is this shaped like? Boshi, what is the boshi shape like? In addition to what is the pattern on this? Because there's actually different patterns. Akago, which is the tang of the blade, looks like this. This is also a very important thing to look at when you're trying to appraise something or figure out how old it is or who made it. Um, not so much the Mokugiana. All that really tells you is that it got remounted at some point. Somebody changed what fittings and they decided they liked a different shaped handle. But you can tell like from the shape of this thing at the end that the original length or was it shortened at some point? Because there were certain periods of Japan where either the style was for shorter swords, or there's either a, or a law that specifically said you cannot carry a sword that is longer than a certain length. Again, that was part of the Tokugawa shogunate wanting to control samurai clans out in the provinces. So only the Tokugawa and select, like, really trusted clans were allowed to have full length like really long swords, everyone else had to have like shorter ones. Of course, the idea there is it gives your soldiers an advantage over the enemy because they've got bigger swords, they have better reach. Uh, there are some clans that secretly ignored that rule. But anyway, and of course, you can't quite see it in this picture, but this thing is pointing to something called Yasurime, which is actually file marks. This part of the sword is like nicely polished and it's nice and shiny. Is this back part here, nice and shiny, almost like a mirror finish. And then this is almost like a, not quite a matte finish, but it's not shiny, I guess. Lack of a better word, it's more of a satin finish, and then this is like a glossy, shiny. This area here, they just use files to tidy it up and shape it, and they, they would carve their signature there sometimes, depending on the time period and depending on who it is. For example, one thing, if you see a sword by Masamune, and you see that it's actually signed and it actually has his signature, you can know right there that's not really a Masamune sword, because he never signed his. He worked directly for the Shogun of that time period. It would be very, I guess, arrogant of him to sign his work, one, because he's supposed to be making stuff for the Shogun, so no one is supposed to have it except the Shogun or people that the Shogun gave the swords to. No point in him signing his work. The other thing is because he was so famous and his stuff was so distinct, like, what's the point? Somebody sees the sword without even having to take this out and looking at the hang, they'll know it's his. Also, kind of the later period, like the 1600s and later, where they pretty much always sign the blade there. If you see something from the 1600s or later that doesn't have a signature, it's not as valuable. And 
is not considered as special or as good. Reasoning there being it's probably <laughs> like the Smith didn't think too much of his work there and he was kind of embarrassed to sign it. So if you're looking for a really cheap sword and you just want to have one for the sake of having one, that's one way you could do it is you could find a, a sword from that time period that doesn't have a signature. Personally, I would not recommend it. It is not a sound financial decision, but as long as you're aware that you will be basically throwing money away and you don't care and you really like the sword, hey, do it yourself. You're, all, you're allowed to do that. It's your money. Kind of goes back to the earlier discussion about we have Tachi versus Katana, and this kind of clearly shows the difference between the Tachi is kind of a more slender, elegant shape, and it has more of a a taper from the basically the handle area up to the tip. Katana is going to be more thick and robust. Again, the Tachi is going to be traditionally displayed or worn with the cutting edge down, whereas the Katana is cutting edge up. Wakazashi is like the short sword, again, cutting edge up because it's kind of worn with the Katana, same way. And these always, I think, started out being worn thrust through the belt. So you would actually see kind of in the early period, Samurai might have a Tachi and like a Wakazashi as well. Tachi would be like hanging from their waist whereas the wakazashi would be thrust through the belt. Probably in the earlier period, more likely a tanto than a wakazashi. And this shaku is the traditional means of measuring things. You talk about a sword, it's usually going to be about between two and three shaku length. A short sword or a wakazashi is going to be between, you know, a little bit less than, than two. And then a tanto is probably going to be one shaku or less. And this kind of explains in, in metric that measurement. And you measure that length, I believe, from Neimachi up to the Taki. Why they have that line drawn. That that part there is kind of where the blade ends and the hang of the blade begins. So this part from here on, everything to the left of that line would be covered by a handle. Incidentally, this comes from a book called Facts and Funnels of Japanese Swords, A Collector's Guide. Buy this on Amazon. I think it's like 20 or 30 bucks. It is a good book. It's got a lot of interesting information. Some people say it's got very kind of controversial or interesting takes, so it's kind of controversial. But some of the very, very fundamental basic information in there is is good. There's also many various different shapes of swords. This one kind of covers that same information. These are kind of the earlier shape, kind of similar to that chokuto, where it's straight and it's got that. Still only has the one cutting edge, but it's straight. Also kind of like sharp angle there. On the later period swords, it's more of a rounded where it changes from the tip cutting edge. This is an interesting shape called hirazukuri. I think later on there's another slide that kind of covers the different types of construction or different cross sections of the sword. This is a cool thing, it's called a Ken sword. These are actually not meant so much for combat so much as a religious thing. It, I believe it is actually primarily Buddhist. That's, that's kind of a cool thing that you'll see occasionally from time to time. Naginata is one of my favorite things ever, and these are interesting as well because they also change shape from time period. They're called Nagamaki. They're also really cool. You can see it's very similar to Naginata, and technically speaking, all, all of these things, some people say, are the same, like Naginata and Nagamaki. The only difference is how it was mounted, so whether you put it at the end of a long pole, whether whether it's just got like a really long handle kind of depends on whether it's a naginata so the naginata would be the long pole like a spear almost whereas the nagamaki be kind of like a great sword in a way where like half the length is the blade and the other half the length is the handle for my mentor there's actually something tricky about the shape especially kind of around here the nagamaki would typically have that yokote naginata would not it would just be straight all the way up to the tip now you'll also see short swords that have that shape, but they've been modified. A short sword, so it's no longer a spearhead anymore. Like originally a naginata or a nagamaki, and that was like shortened into a short sword, and they call that nagamaki or naginata naoshi. Kind of like cut part of the, the haft off or part of the tang, reshape the tip to make it less like less of a pronounced curve, more, you know, more shaped like this. Kind of a, an interesting thing. Different types of spears as well. This doesn't necessarily cover all of them. My favorite is called Jumonji Yari, and there's another one called Katakama Yari, where it's only got this thing. There's another one called Chidori Jumonji, where it's almost like a trident. Those are really, really rare and really hard to find. We get into appraising swords. One of the first things that you're looking at, I'm actually skipping ahead a little bit. One of the first things you, you look at, you can cut it maybe a little bit in here. Ada. A term for shift of the more foot-based combat occurred. Why do they continue to maintain the single cutting edge style of blade? Um, probably, I mean, I honestly don't have a good answer for that. I think it's probably more for this tradition and staying with the, the traditional method of making the swords and traditional fighting styles. There are actually some cases of double-edged swords, either like 
first half of the back edge is sharp, or in some cases, even the entire thing is sharp. Generally see that more in the short swords. My friend actually has a dagger that is um, called a Yoroi Doshi, which basically means armor piercer. It's in a shape called Mozukuri sharp on both sides, but it still has a slight curve to it. It's a really brutal thing. It's almost like an ice pick. It's nasty. <laughs> it's a nasty thing. So one of the first things that you look at when you're trying to appraise a sword is something called Hada, is the grain pattern. And you can see this is a really funky, wonky one. This is called Ayasugi Hada, as you can see in there. And this actually comes out as part of the forging process. So you know they talk about, oh, samurai sword, pure Nihon steel a million times, filthy gaijin go home. Um, that is not quite correct. They only folded it about 16 to 17 times, but it kind of starts when they're making the sword. It's like a billet like this. Uh, this is kind of a modern person obviously making it. They're using a power hammer, but they kind of drive a wedge in there to split it and they'll fold it over on itself, depending on whether you do it lengthwise or crosswise, or if you alternate, alternate between lengthwise or crosswise, that will affect the brain pattern, cause these different, oh, where did it go? Cause these different types of patterns to appear there. One of the hardest ones ever, actually, and one of my favorites is called Masame Hara. That one is meant to be kind of like straight lines, or it looks like, but it's meant to resemble like wood grain. It's actually very, very beautiful, and it's one of the hardest ones to pull off because it's hard to keep all those layers connected. They'll actually, it's not uncommon to see openings in the layers there, little pockets. They call that kitai ware. Technically, it is considered a flaw, but it's one that's not really ragged on unless like full of them or they're really big. I can kind of show you. I've actually got some on one of my, show you what they look like. They're generally not considered that big a deal for the most part, as long as they're small and sparse. But with this particular type of hada, because you're trying to keep that, you're actually drawing out that billet in just one long thing, holding it over in such a way that it's a long thing. It's kind of hard to keep these layers together and not have any little openings. One of my favorite school wordsmithing is called the Hosho School. They were famous for this particular style because if you get a uh, condition one, they don't have any gaps. It's like totally solid. They're absolutely gorgeous to behold. I've never actually seen one in person. I've seen photos but they're they're super impressive and again i i just love that wood grain kind of appearance there in fact this one might be got some of the characteristics there you also see something called well this one is unique kind of the the two main ones that you see are mehada supposed to be kind of like burl of tree bark way or wood grain kind of one is really common and then there is Oh, not have it? Oh, they don't have a picture of it. The other one is called Itame Hara. And that one, it's very similar to Mokume. It's kind of hard to tell them apart. But Itame, you see these complete burls don't really happen all that often. One, one I would almost consider to be like Itame with mixed Mokume. Itame, you've got these complete burls there, like a complete circle. Itame is kind of more random, kind of kind of like this one where it's almost a burl, but there's it's not quite complete. And so one of the first things you look at at a sword is you kind of look at the steel structure there. That kind of tells you fired it. I'll kind of get into the different schools later time. Next thing you look at is again kind of coming back to that differential hardening. You've got nie and yoi. What that is referring to is within this differential hardening, especially along the habuchi, the the crystalline structure of the steel will change because this is much more higher carbon content. So I'm looking at my stream and I'm seeing this is actually yellow. I wonder if there's some sort of a correction I've got on my camera here that is meddling with things a little bit. Actual swords. But ye, what we're seeing here, and that's the hiragana character for ni e, and the kanji character for it. This is kind of like large crystals, almost like sugar grains. So if you see something that is like a combination of ni e deki, deki is kind of like craftsmanship or worksmanship. That kind of refers to differentially hardened edge have these big kind of crystals in it or kind of interspersed throughout it. Ye and is this grain itame. Well, that tells you that it's probably the Soshu school that made this sword or somebody like descended from them. Whereas if you see the other type, which is Nioi, really fine crystals and it's really almost like mist on the edge here. It's Nioi and Mokumehara, then it's probably Bizen based, like the in school or somebody kind of inspired by that tradition or taught from that tradition. But that's kind of like the first steps for how you're going into it. Fortunately, again, that yellow is kind of messed up. But these, the, that's just the kanji character for Nioi. Or 
hiragana characters and i will actually try to type that in chat but this sword is a good example of something that is yeah deki i probably shouldn't actually be sharing this picture because the guy who takes these photos is a really kind of high high ranked dealer and he does not like it when people share his photos with well, that is but i'm just gonna blast past that one pretty quick that was a good example of nie deki this is another one from that same guy this is an example of nioi deki but it's actually a bizen sword these are kind of the different shapes that you'll see japanese swords so shinogi zukuri is like the kind of the default one that you see in the vast majority of the long swords especially like katana or tachi and what that means is you've got this long central ridge going up there and then the okay that clearly splits the kisaki away from the rest of the cutting edge of the sword. Here there's like a cross section that shows it's like almost a diamond cross section here. Another one called shobu zukuri that in short sword tashi or smaller. One does not have that yokote that clearly separates the hip or the kisaki from the rest of it. it. Has that long ridge that goes up either side and it still has that kind of diamond shape. I have something called hiro zukuri which usually you most commonly see in tanto or wakizashi so that daggers or the sh sometimes you see it in katana basically means it's flat on both sides it doesn't have these long ridges and it doesn't have that yokote that separates it katakiri katakiri hazukuri almost like a scandinavian grind well not even I'm trying to remember what this type of grind is called in western terms but basically the cutting edge is it's totally flat on one side and it's almost totally flat up till the very end and then it's got a little bevel there and you mostly see this on daggers sometimes Oroha Zukuri is almost the same thing as Shobu Zukuri. The difference is it's sharp on both sides. And I, I know somebody that has a dagger shaped like this, armor piercing dagger. That doesn't necessarily mean that everything that is Moroha Zukuri is going to be an armor piercing item. That, that's how this particular armor piercing dagger was. Typically, those Yoro Edoshi are very thick. Taki Moroha Zukuri is something that you occasionally see in long swords where back that kind of blunt edge is actually sharp at the tip sometimes even as far back as like halfway up still has that curve and it's still sharp all the way and it still has that that ridge going through this shape be in like pole arms might occasionally also see this in in daggers that were meant to sort of resemble pole arms not actually too familiar with this one i have personally haven't seen it very often one is kind of similar to that this one i think is more you might see more often in things that are shortened from like a naginata or nagamaki and maybe is something that is either nagamaki or forged specifically to look like one. And then this is a really funky thing. I haven't seen too many antique daggers that look like this, but there are some modern made ones that have this shape, like all tip, all tip. It's just for stabbing. I guess you could you could cut with that, but that's that's a stabbing knife. These This information is all coming out of a book called The Connoisseur's Book of Japanese Swords by Kokan Nagayama. That book is also on Amazon. I think it's about $80 for hardcover, a bit pricey. But it is an excellent, excellent book. Um, it does, from what I understand, have some errors or mistakes in it. My mentor. Um, but overall, it's an excellent book. You read this and over and over. It is a great reference. Even if you're like a really advanced collector, a lot of people still come back to this one. Things in English. The beginner, like it's kind of like advanced beginner book, if that makes sense. So differences in the curvature, like where the primary part of the curve is. And it's maybe a little subtle, kind of hard to see if you're not used to it. Zori is like those Shinto gates that you see at the Shinto shrines. Anime all over the place, those kind of orange looking things. That means is it's kind of the center of the curve or the peak of the curve is smack in the middle, just like the Tori gate. Oshizori, which you see usually in the earlier swords and also things from the Bizen tradition, curve is predominantly handled, almost straight most of the length, and then suddenly a curve towards the tip, or curve towards the handle. Kizori is the opposite of that where it's almost straight up to the end, where you see this more, whoops, more often in that Civil War period, the Muromachi period. Also something called Uchizori that you'll see in the daggers or sometimes the short sword, Dashi. It actually curves down towards the cutting edge. That is an interesting Kante point time periods. It basically means nothing, totally straight. Akizori, again, is the same as with the katana or the longsword, where it's like mostly straight and then suddenly towards the tip it starts to curve. So we call these things the shinogi, that ridge. High shinogi, which means it's like a thick, chunky sword, or a low shinogi, meaning it's more of a narrow, thin sword. Hiraniku, I think if I read this correctly, it's kind of referring to as the blade goes down from the shinogi down towards the cutting edge, is it kind of like convex, right word, bowing out maybe a little bit. Not that it's bowing out wider this, but kind of like a curve going towards that, almost like a bevel or of a straight or a flat change from the shinogi iku by the way eat iku oftentimes when you're talking about japanese swords means like 
amount of steel that's left between the cutting edge and the shino as if somebody describes something as having a lot of neat very healthy thick blade thick meaning from the cutting edge all the way to the back so it's it's not been polished or restored a whole bunch that's probably closer to its original shape also a variety of uh, hips shapes tucky which is like one Saki, which is kind of the default or the more the more average, more common one. Or Kisaki, which are pretty really aggressive looking. You see a lot of these in the like the 1780s up through the 1800s, and you see it also in the Nambo Kucho period. Everybody is trying to walk around with those huge, thick swords with the really long tips to try and show off and scare people. Masu Kisaki, kind of it's just like a straight line rather than a curve, guys here. Saki, you see on the earlier swords are the ones meant to look like the early sword, kind of like short and stumpy. Translation is like there's also a lot of different patterns here. That temporal line, that differential hardening. I'm not going to go through all of these. That's a lot. It's going to take forever. My understanding is, generally speaking, everything follows one of two patterns. It's either suguha, which means straight, ome, which means wavy. You might have something called choji in suguha. I have lots of tight little wells along there, but they're all kind of following roughly a straight line. But you might have like choji in gunome, where you have those those little bumps, but they kind of go up and down and up and down. It goes along, so it's kind of like a wavy. So there's like parts where the that tempered edge is like thicker, thinner, and then thicker as opposed to consistent part to finish. Another one called notare, where it's kind of like starts kind of straight and then it kind of does the wavy thing. If I remember that correctly, or it could also be kind of more random, whereas the May is going to be a bit more regular. That makes sense. In fact, it kind of compares the two here. Kare is more like a random kind of swell that happens up and down throughout the blade. When Asamune did, out of the other people in the Soshu school, especially early Soshu school, I think Kare actually last slide in my present. Now comes the fun part. Uh, what I was saying, this is a navy sword. Uh, you can tell it's a navy sword because let me see if it'll focus on it there. Part of it is this area. So that ray skin is dyed black. That's called the, uh, oh man, Same, Samegawa. So it's dyed black. Um, both the army and the navy will have that kind of brown uh, silk wrap around it. And they'll still have the, uh, these are called menuki in here in the handle. Those are hilt charms. This thing here, that little peg, is called a menu, uh, mekugi. It's like a little bamboo peg, and it's literally what keeps the handle on the sword. And then this is the kashira, this metal thing on the butt cap here. It's not a pommel. You don't really smash people with it. You can, but this is called the fuchi, this collar here. And then this is called the tsuba. And you can actually probably just barely see that little silver thing there. It's called seppa. Those are spacers that helps kind of make sure that this doesn't get loose and wobbly. And I know it looked a little wobbly when I did it there, but it's actually pretty, fairly tight. And then the other thing that you can use to tell that this is a navy sword is it's got the two hangers and it's got the black ray skin on the scabbard. So if you will focus on the kind of webcam thing, so the way that you draw a sword when you're not, you know, doing martial arts, if you're like a collector, the first thing is you're going to want to put a hand on the scabbard right there and your thumb on the subo, the handguard. And then the other one goes on the handle the other thumb goes here, you can kind of push off on each other, kind of doing that motion. Then you kind of come under and grab like that, and you're going to pull it out. So that's kind of the full length there. And I'm going to try not to talk too much over the sword because you don't want to get spittle on it because that'll cause rust. Um, but I will be um, oiling it up after I do this. So next thing I want to do, I have this handy thing called a Mikugi Nuki. It's a little brass hammer. You can use that. Kind of push that little bamboo peg out. I'm going to put that somewhere where I won't lose it because those things run away all the time. And I just realized I forgot something very important. So one second while I go get that, but I can show you how you put the sword back. back momentarily. I forgot the katana makura, which is a little pillow that you put the sword on. Okay, so this is a katana makura. It's like a little pillow, and that's what you're going to rest the sword on. And I know you love my face, but I don't want to get any spittle or moisture on the sword, so I'm actually going to cover my mouth so I can still talk and not worry about that. So the next thing you do is you're actually going to grab it kind of at the base here, and you're actually going to tilt it 
at about a 45 degree. Make sure there's nobody over there or anything you don't want to cut. And you take a fist and you go BAM! Just smack your other wrist and you'll see that actually loosened everything. So I can just slide the handle off and of course the suva and everything flew off with it. I was not expecting that to happen. So what I'm doing now is I'm removing the rest of the materials. This thing here is called the habaki and that is actually like the collar. This is what actually keeps it from slipping and sliding out of the, the scabbard. And it's actually got, you can see there, there's this end here is the part that actually is like facing towards the blade. And then this flat end here is the part that faces towards the handle. So it'll kind of lay like that with the blade going this way and the handle that way. Whenever you put a sword down, you want to put it with the blunt edge on the pillow first, and then you lay it flat. And I'm going to actually come adjust, just checking, make sure I haven't lost any of the suba. I'm going to adjust the light a bit to make it a little easier to see. So this is important because this is how I'm going to hold the sword with my free hand. So let me see if we can zoom in a little. And this is going to be real cool because once I adjust, it's going to be so you might in a second there be able to see what I'm trying to show, which is some of that steel grain that I was talking about earlier. Sorry, if you get motion sickness, the boom that the camera is on is not super stable. So this is going to be almost like a uh, like a microscopic view. But this one is Mokume Hara. So this is kind of, uh, if you kind of see the whole sword and I'm going to slide it back, you see how that temper line kind of almost stays the same thickness throughout the whole sword. It doesn't really vary too much. I mean, it does undulate. So that's kind of like what we're talking about when we're saying this is in Suguha rather than say Gunome. And this particular sword was made in 1944 by the swordsmith Tsutsui Kiyokane or Kiyokane Tsutsui. Normally the World War II swords don't have a whole lot of activity in them. Or, I mean, sometimes they do, but normally it's kind of hard to see activity in that steel grain. Kind of hard to see the uh, the hara there. Just that, that kind of texture that I'm trying to show you there. Not necessarily the white misty area, but what's above it. And in some spots in this sword, like right there, kind of in the center of the image, once the image kind of stops, right about there, you can see a little bit of that kind of thicker, almost sugar grain type crystalline structure. That's nie. And then like the thin kind of misty stuff, that's kind of indistinct. You don't really see individual distinct crystals. That's nioi. And kind of like I was talking about earlier with a steel grain pattern, that hara, um, that is kind of that stuff that you're seeing above it. I'm not actually going to touch the sword here. So this area up here, this is the hara. And all those different lines that you're seeing, those different burls are like the different layers of the steel as they forged it. And contrary to popular belief, I know everybody likes to meme saying folded one million times, folded 1,000 times. At most, they were only ever really folded maybe 17 times, maybe 22, I think is like the record. Um, it's just that each time you fold it, you're kind of exponentially increasing the number of layers. So that's why they say there could be like a thousand layers of steel there rather than, you know, actually folding it a thousand times. That would be a little bit excessive and you probably lose a lot of the carbon and it would end up just pig iron basically if you fold it that much. Um, I also wanted to show this is the kisaki, the tip, and you can only just barely make out the boshi or the hamon in there, that kind of white misty edge. Uh, that is partly because of the well, that's, that's partly because of the lighting and the camera, but also because of the way that they polish the edge of the sword. Uh, the way that they sharpen them is they rub it against a grindstone or a whetstone. Not really a grindstone, because that applies kind of like big round thing that the, is constantly spinning. It's, it's like a whetstone that they've got clamped down somewhere and they put water on it and uh, kind of rub it against varying grits of that. So you can just barely make that out, that boshi. But that is actually a very important thing for the kante, which means appraisal. So if you can see that and you can kind of tell what that is, that indicates to you who might have made this. So I'm trying to kind of move it back and forth a little bit to show you, hopefully you can see it there. And let me get to another good spot in the blade here. Let's see if I can, so once this is in focus, so you'll notice there's kind of that white misty edge, that cutting edge, right? And then 
like there's like a border between the white misty edge and kind of the normal steel that is there's that like white line that runs along there that's called the habuchi and that's kind of like the uh it'll be more more thick with the crystals so to speak and so that's kind of a cool thing to see if you can actually get the lighting right. It's really, I, I tried to do it with my camera and my lighting last night to try and see if I could show it. But if you actually, um, I'll have to show on the webcam. So if you take your attention to the webcam in a second here. So I've got the sword kind of pointing actually towards a lamp in front of me. And I can actually look up the whole length of the sword and that white border, that habuchi lights up. It's almost like, a, it almost glows in the light. Unfortunately, I couldn't really figure out how to show that on camera. Hopefully I'll figure out how to do that for next time. It's kind of showing how you angle it and show, kind of point it. But I'm actually going to go get the other sword. And while I do that, I have to put this one up. I have to kind of reassemble it. So while I do that, I will put something kind of interesting on display here. First thing I need to do, and again, whenever you pick these things up, you're gonna roll it so the flat edge is against the pillow. And you can maybe kind of see that. Ooh, that reminds me, now that we're kind of showing this. This is going to be super hard to show because the camera will not want to focus on the cutting edge. But you kind of see how there's, we're looking at the cutting edge straight on from here. I'm going to start sliding it up. And you should see right about there is where it starts to get blunt. So I'm going to put my finger kind of at the uh, end of the tang there. So you'll probably just barely see it in the camera. So this part is the part that's covered by the habaki, but just above that is where the blade starts. And you can actually tell a little bit that it's not sharp there, it's blunt there. So they call that ubuha, because originally the sword is not sharp there. It's kind of only sharp from a little bit further up. So I just thought that would be something kind of cool to show. I'm gonna start putting this one back together so I can put it away safely. In fact, I will just put the habaki back on. Well, no, I need to, I need to reassemble the whole thing. So I'm put the habaki back on, and I'm putting sepa, which is those little silver spacers. And then the suba has these little extra decorative things on it, like a wave pattern. In fact, I will put that, you can see that in a second here, when the lag catches up. I don't know why, but the camera just does not want to focus on this specific spot. Maybe it is too close. There we go. That's much better focus. Haha! -ha. And now we've got that cool microscope view. I figured it out. I remembered how I did it last night. Give me a second here to properly put the cloth underneath my hand there. Okay, so this should hopefully show Nie once I find that particular spot that has it. Okay, just give it a second here. You should see it any second now. There it is. So that's what Nie looks up super up close and magnified. See that's uh, like crystalline structure. If I rotate it a little bit, it kind of catches the light. And you can clearly see that habuchi, that white border between the two. You'll notice this sword has, I think, a fair amount of, it's called jinye. See how there's, in between those layers, there's a lot of that uh, kind of white, almost like marbling on a steak, for lack of a better word. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's called jinye. Just back out of the super zoomed in view there. I'll go back to putting this together. Any questions or comments on the first sword? Okay, and then kind of look at the webcam. So I've got the handle here. I'm putting it in, making sure it's adjusted or oriented correctly. And then I'm gonna kind of grasp at the bottom there. Of course, making sure I'm not about to bonk anything. And then make sure it sits correctly and everything's put together. You just smack the bottom. And I'm gonna look through the Makugi Ana, which is that hole that the Makugi goes through. The Makugi being this thing, the little wooden peg, the bamboo peg, that through. And I'm going to use the little hammer to just kind of tap that into place, make sure it stays put. I'm going to sh just kind of do that a little, make sure it's not wiggling, make sure everything's nice and tight, and then see if I can do it in such a way that it's in screen here. Normally, I would oil this back up before putting it away. I will actually have to do that off camera after this, because it's going to take some time to do that correctly. But in the meantime, while I do that, I will let you have a look at this. That is a suba, it's a handguard. And that one probably dates to about the 1800s. And that is kind of an interesting uh, Buddhist iconography there. And I'll come explain that a little bit when I come back. Okay. So this other sword that I have here 
is about the 1700s, so, or excuse me, 1670s to 1680s. Uh, to answer your question, suboptimal, I sometimes display them. It depends on my mood. Generally speaking, it's kind of best to keep them tucked away, just, you know, in case anybody ever breaks in. You don't want it, like, out in the open. Um, also, I've heard stories about people that have them on display and, like, the sunlight hits the scabbard and apparently that, like, seeps the moisture out of the scabbard and it causes the blade to rust, which is very interesting. So it's kind of best to, to keep them in a silk bag and keep them stored away somewhere. But you can put them on display on, like, special occasions, like you have guests or something or, like, a party or something like that. Um, you may, it'll be kind of hard to see because it's hard to get the whole thing in shot. But you'll see that this one is actually fairly straight, and that was kind of the style of the time period that it was made. And also, kind of talking about earlier, you see the samurai swords very often have that kind of fancy knot tied around here. But this one, that cord, is just kind of loosely tied at the end, just like a normal square knot. And that's how they probably would have actually kept them for the most time, or for most of the time, because that was how you actually used it. So the nakugi on this one is pretty tough. So again, I'm grasping it kind of at the bottom of the handle there. I'm going to angle it a little off to the side, and then I'm smart enough to grab it below the suba this time so it doesn't fall. I'm going to pull the handle away, and I'll remove all this stuff. I'll keep the habaki there, move the habaki. This is kind of a more decorative one. Get it in camera. So that one is actually, I don't know if it's solid silver or silver plated, but that design there is like, uh, it's supposed to represent rainfall. It's very pretty. And most of these fittings, I think, are probably probably 1700s or 1800s. So again, whenever you lay it down, you put it down with a blunt edge and then roll it over. The first thing you're gonna see is actually a little bit of, it's called tobiyaki. So you see there's that kind of round ball. Again, I'm not touching the sword. There's this little round ball of kind of separately tempered steel that's separate from the rest of that line. That's kind of an interesting feature that you'll see sometimes in swords from like the uh, 1600s and onwards. Sometimes you'll see stuff called, uh, geez, I already forgot what, it, Hitatsura, where you see that stuff all over the blade, because normally, again, I'm not touching the sword with the, the metal thing here, but normally, like this area, called the Mune, that area generally does not ever have any tempered steel in it. Normally that's just kind of like it is on this one, but with Hitatsura, you'll actually see tempering up there as well, like the whole sword, cutting edge, blunt edge, just random spots all up and down. Maneuver to a spot where it's easier to see. Oh, I think this one should be all right. You can see here, this is kind of an example of that uh, Mokume Hara again. It's not super interesting to look at, so I won't spend too long on it. But you can tell this one, this sword is, I think, Nioiguchi, because it's kind of very faint, very subtle. You don't see those individual grains, those individual crystals. You can actually see sometimes how the uh, the steel grain there, that hara, affects the hamon. The hamon being that that misty clear e or misty sharp edge. So this sword has all kinds of interesting activity. It's kind of got these little things. It's got that tobiaki, the little loose ball floating there, and it's got these kind of ear shapes going up and down. It's a very interesting sword to look at and appreciate. And I think this is like an original polish. So I'm not going to get this one restored. It doesn't need it because you can still see all the all the activity. So even though it's got a couple little scratches and scratches and scuffs, there's no reason to send this to a polisher because anytime it gets restored, it's gonna you're you're taking steel off of the blade and you can never put that back. And you know the people who made these have been dead for a couple hundred years, so it's not like they're making any new ones to replace them, right? I want to show something kind of interesting on this guy as well. I have another example of that tobiyaki with the, the ear shape. It's going to be tough to see, but the boshi on this one is very different from the other one because it's a lot more, I guess, visible. You can see it's kind of catching the light there and reflecting a bit more. So it's almost kind of like flat, like a, a straight kind of line, whereas the other one was kind of wavy, right? And then this one ends kind of almost like a... It's almost like a paintbrush there. You see the very, again, not touching the sword, but kind of... In this area here, kind of looks like the end of a paint stroke, or the stroke of a paintbrush. And then it's going to be tough to see, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to show it, but that actually tempering actually goes back onto the blunt edge, and it goes past that line. Kind of a, a unique or special characteristic of the smith and the school. Both this sword and the other one were signed. Try so you can see, maybe you'll see the file marks there a little bit. Not quite. This one has a healthy patina on the tang. It's actually safe to touch the. Uh, it's actually safe to touch this part 
Um, is advisable to even still put a little bit of oil on it when you're done. Um, but of course that shiny part, this area, <clears throat> you don't ever want to touch with your bare hands. Partly because swords are basically a big three foot long scalpel. And partly because that finger oil is going to cause, well, rust and corrosion. It's really hard to get that stuff off. So never, ever, 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 ever touch the bare metal of a sword. So there's the signature. It's a bit upside down. Unfortunately, there's not much I can do about that because of the, the angle of the camera and the amount of space that I have on the desk here. But this one is signed, Rakuju Shinano no Kami, I think, Minamoto Nobuyoshi. And this is a very... The signature does not look normal for this guy. So some people were telling me it's possibly a fake signature. Uh, my mentor is the one who sold it to me. He's kind of showed pictures of it online on his public profile. And he's even kind of come on social media and like specifically said, no, this is legit. So I'm pretty confident it is a legitimate signature. It just doesn't look normal for the, uh, the guy. And that does happen. That's one of the things that as you start collecting, you kind of learn that the important thing is not really the signature so much as the characteristics of the sword because there are some cases where, you know, the blacksmiths were illiterate, right? They didn't know how to read or write. So somebody else would write their name, like paint it on the tang, and then they'd chisel it in. And sometimes they'd also kind of have their apprentice chisel it in on their behalf. Um, sometimes they even changed the way that they signed or changed the name that they had. So, you know, I've, I've seen a fake that had a super good fake signature, but the sword didn't have the right characteristics. Like it just didn't look right. So it was it was a, a fake signature, even though it looked absolutely perfect and absolutely correct. And of course there are swords like this one or others that the signature looks kind of weird or wonky, but the the, the craftsmanship is correct. So that's, that's one of the things about this hobby is you'll never know for absolute certain whether something was made by a particular swordsmith unless you're, you know, actually there to watch it happen. You kind of have to get as close as you can and get reasonably accurate, reasonably assured. So yeah, those are my two swords. I do have some fittings, but I'm, I'm getting a little tired here, so I think I might end here. Uh, does have any, anyone have any questions, comments? And this one is quite old, so it does not have any of that ubuha. And I'll try to slide down, hopefully without poking stuff. No, there's stuff in the way, I can't do that. But it's, it's sharp all the way down, all the way to show in the webcam. It goes sharp all the way down to this point right where it ends to the... I'm just gonna slide the habaki back on. And the suba I have for this one is quite interesting as well. This is called Itame style, I think. I think that's what it's called. There we go. So the camera stops shaking. So it's kind of made to look almost like a, a wood burl or a similar pattern, just the way that they did the, the iron there. And this was actually made by, it's Myochin, which was actually a famous family of armor smiths, but they also made these suba, these hand guards. And that's got the Nice little signature there. And there's a little, there's a little things there, kind of right at the edge. They actually used a punch to tap the metal there to make it fit the sword that it was being put onto. Were there any swords that turned out, that were thought to be important, but then turned out to not be important? That actually happened quite a lot. That happened quite a lot. There was a family of appraisers called the um, Honami, and they kind of got in trouble kind of like in the 1900s because they would uh, be paid by these great lords or, you know, wealthy families. Like, hey, we've got these this family heirloom. Can you confirm that it is what we think it is? And they'd be like, uh, yeah, sure. Or even in the daimyo era, there were swords that were kind of famous or known to be really important. And so focus on this one a little bit better. That's actually a nice close-up of the... Uh, the wrap that they do and again this is probably like 1700s 1800s but there are also cases where there'd be like famous swords in the the samurai era and you know uh, the shogun would be like i want that give it to me but the person who owned it was like no i don't want to give this up this is awesome so they'd go to somebody have a fake made and that happened pretty often and of course there were a lot of swords where they had like a fake signature on it that's a little arabesque design there uh, a lot of swords that had a fake signature added onto it Partly to like scam people, you know, even back in the samurai era. Um, partly because <clears throat> warlords would give swords as rewards to people for good service. But sometimes they couldn't afford like the really fancy sword. So it's kind of like, you know, working for small business and you get a fake Rolex as a reward for doing a good job. You know it's fake. 
the boss knows it's fake, but it's, you know, it's like an open secret that you both know it's fake, but it's the sentiment of, if I could afford a real Rolex to give you, I would. So that was kind of one of the mentalities of it. At least that's what I've come to understand. I could be wrong. And something else very interesting about this sword, move the blade out of the way and show the scabbard, because the scabbard is also very interesting. This, once I get it in the camera, this is crushed abalone shell. And they specifically picked only the green bits. So this whole thing is covered in that, that abalone shell. So this would have been very, very expensive back in the old days. I'll try to zoom in so you can see the, the mother of pearl there. That fancy pants abalone shell. We're getting out of focus. We need to go into focus. Come on now. I'm sorry if you're getting motion sickness from watching this. This is a macro lens and we are zoomed in very close. And the tripod boom thing that I have on it is uh, not super stable. That's just, that's the whole thing is just covered in these teensy weensy little bits of green abalone shell. And that's sealed in there with lacquer. So it's kind of suspended in multiple layers. They'd like put a layer of lacquer and then like the abalone shells and then more lacquer, like clear lacquer and then more abalone shell. And they just kind of layered it up. So it's got like a 3D metallic paint kind of appearance to it. Like you see on some of those classic cars. So I really enjoy this one. 